Hey guys, and welcome to Human Evolution Lecture. And uh, so let's take a look at um, where humans come from and where we might be going. Uh, so we're going to be looking at order primates. That's the order of organisms we belong to. And primates evolved from um, shrew-like insectivores. So the earliest primates would have looked uh, very, very different from what, uh, what primates, of course, today look like. And primates tend to have a brain that's quite large compared to its body size. Um, they tend to be omnivorous, and so we don't have like the canines of, of some of the um, uh, uh, meat-eating uh, animals and stuff. So we're very adapted to eating different types of food. We also have an opposable thumb. And we have vision with very good depth perception. And those are characteristics uh, typical in primates. And when we look at the family, the, or I should say the order of, of primates, there is a few different groups within that. We have the prosimi, and these are tree shrews, lemurs, and uh, tarsier. Then we have anthropoidea. And uh, in Anthropoidea, we have Seboidea. These are New World monkeys. So if you go down to um, the Amazon rainforest or um, parts of Central America and you see little monkeys running around in the trees, uh, that's our New World monkeys. Uh, the oldest that we know of is in the Oligocene. And these monkeys have a prehensile tail, so they can hold on to things with their tail. Um, and uh, the this is an early branch that's not a part of human evolution. So they're kind of on their own, not uh, dealing with evolution of, of Homo sapiens. And a good examples of these are things like spider monkeys and capuchin monkeys. Um, that's a monkey, um, uh, I don't know exactly what kind, but I took a picture of it in Belize. So that's a New World monkey. Uh, we also, in the Anthropoidea group, we have Cercopithecoidea. These are old world monkeys. They do not have a prehensile tail. Some examples are macaques, barbary apes, and baboons. Now, this is an old world monkey. This is uh, off on uh, the Isle of Gibraltar, and or Rock of Gibraltar. and. Um, there's an interesting story about these. So uh, some of them get really, really used to all the tourists there and it start like stealing things and assaulting the tourists and doing stuff like that. And so a few years ago, um, the like bad monkeys uh, were rounded up and they were exiled to Scotland where they live on some like um, game refuge or something and don't have any tourists that they can harass. So anyway, this is one of the ones I think that got exiled to Scotland. All right, uh, but the ones that we are going to be concerned with today are homonoidea. These are tail, completely tailless apes. We're looking at chimpanzees, gibbons, gorillas, and humans. So here's our um, basically family tree of uh, primates. So we have order of primates there. There's the prosimi, right, the lemurs and stuff. There's anthropoidea. Here's the uh, New World monkey branch. And this is the uh, branch going all the way to humans. And there's the Old World monkey branch. And so that's the uh, uh, family tree there for primates. The earliest primates actually date all the way back to the late Cretaceous. So the earliest primates were around at the time of the last dinosaurs. And um, the oldest one that we know of is named Purgatorius and is found in the Hell Creek Formation of Montana. And this is what uh, Purgatorius would look like. Now, in the Cenozoic, when we get to the early Cenozoic following the uh, mass extinction of the dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous, we see a number of changes occur in primates. So the muzzle length, right, this snout on there, that starts getting shorter. We also see the brain size getting larger. Um, eye orbits uh, move uh, to being very much in the front of the skull. Um, we uh, see both a t the thumb for grasping and um, a big toe for grasping. 
and you get nails instead of the really, really sharp claws. And this is an early primate, and we can see that grasping uh, uh, big toe there, and we can see it has uh, hands that would be very uh, deft for holding and onto things. And in the Oligocene, the early anthropoids break off, they, they evolutionarily follow their own path away from the monkey. So we have this divergence where the monkeys follow one path of evolution and the anthropoids follow another path. And a good example of uh, one of these Oligocene early anthropoids is Aegyptopithecus. Uh, dated to about 33 to 34 million years ago. Now, this uh, uh, early anthropoid was still very monkey-like. It was arboreal, means it made its home in the trees. Uh, it did have a tail, but its teeth are already starting to look like the higher apes, meaning it's starting to get teeth more like what you'd see in gorillas and stuff, and, and us. Now, by the time we enter into the Miocene, there's a number of changes happening on Earth. At this point in time, we get Arabia, Africa, so this plate that involves uh, Arabia and Africa, collides with Asia. And what this does then, it alters the ocean currents that were flowing through the Tethia Sea. Remember that whole Tethia Sea that basically separated all the southern continents from the northern continents in the Cretaceous? Well, we're closing that, and so we're changing these um, uh, ocean current patterns, which is going to change the climate system. And East Africa, where our um, anthropoids are evolving, starts getting much drier. And this is going to place some selective pressures on, um, on primates. And um, so what we're going to see is um, uh, as things get drier, the vegetation is going to change in Africa. And that's going to mean that just like with the horse, as the vegetation changed, the horse had to evolve to, um, to still thrive in that changing environment. We see the same thing happen with these um, anthropoids. They have to change to adapt to this uh, uh, environment. Uh, and by about 18 million years ago, monkeys and apes migrated from Africa into uh, Eurasia. Now, let's take a look at what happened. This is, I've, I know, a very busy graph, but there's a lot of very good information on here. So here we have our time periods, Oligocene, Miocene, Pliocene, Pleistocene, and then that's the Holocene right there. Now, things I want to point out um, that are important in here is, for example, this. This is the climate. And uh, what we're looking at is back here, the climate in East Africa is wetter. And as we progress closer to the modern day, it gets drier and drier. And that's then going to affect the vegetation. So here are some... Um, um, uh, graphs concerning vegetation, and you can see here we had a rainforest, right? Pan-African, that means all across Africa, we had this rainforest. But we start seeing it going away, and we start seeing the savanna expanding, more savanna. And a savanna is um, a grassland with a few trees. It's very much like uh, kind of our prairies here, except you have a few trees dotting that area. So what we're seeing then is this change from having lots and lots of trees, right, that rainforest, to having lots and lots of grassland. And that is going to affect the evolution of, uh, of the hominids, of, of uh, our group. So let's look at our earliest hominins, or hominids, um, and we're going to go to about six to seven million years ago. And we have Sahelanthropus chadensis. 
and he's upright and he stands about four feet tall and the skull if you look at it has a mix of both kind of ape features and more hominid features we can see this skull right here right it does have a lot of ape-like features like some of these brow ridges and things but notice that we're getting a larger brain case something very typical of later hominids but this is what uh, that organism probably looked like. That's, uh, you know, a, 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 our best estimate. Now, um, we're going to move forward a little bit, and we're at about 4.4 to 5.8 million years ago. We have Artipithecus. And the skeleton, when we look at Artipithecus, shows that it was comfortable both walking upright and climbing in trees. Now remember what I was saying about the climate, right? We had a lot of trees to begin with, but then we're starting to get more and more grasslands. And that's that evolutionary pressure that I'm talking about. So these, these hominins have to um, adapt to not having as many trees to travel in and trees to hide from predators in and things like that and have to uh, now survive in these expanding grasslands. And how to do that? Um, standing straighter, standing taller, um, walking bipedally, walking upright. Uh, what does that give you an advantage? Well, you can now see above the grasses, you can see predators that might be coming, you can move relatively quickly on the ground um, if, if you can't get into the trees to hide from, uh, uh, from predators. And so we're kind of having this moment here where it both still kind of carries over some of the arboreal characteristics of the earlier organisms, but we're also moving to that um, more modern and having to deal with living in these drier grasslands. So this is a, um, um, some of the skeleton of um, uh, Artipithecus, and you can see it still has these very long arms that are typical uh, for climbing. And, uh, but it also, um, the pelvis shows that it could walk upright. Now let's go to Australopithecus, which is a relatively famous uh, of this early hominins, 1.8 to 4.2 million years ago. This was bipedal, so Australopithecines walked on uh, two legs, had this upright stature. The dentition, the teeth, looked very uh, similar to modern humans, but they were more robust. They were, they were kind of stronger, uh, probably for, you know, I don't know, cracking open nuts, eating them, something like that. So kind of similar to our teeth, but just beefier. Um, now they do, while their brains were bigger than earlier primates, um, they are smaller than what modern humans have. And uh, Lucy, the very famous fossil, is Australopithecus afarensis. And this is the Lucy uh, skeleton, and this is a reconstruction of what she probably looked like. Now we do know how these Australopithecines walked and what kind of, what kind of stride they have because um, in Africa, uh, this uh, trackway, these footprints, have been um, excavated. And uh, what happened there, there was a volcanic eruption where a bunch of ash fell and then it rained, so you had this kind of wet, muddy ash type stuff. And um, a couple of Australopithecines, an adult and a child, walked through that area. So we can actually see what, uh, like, how they walked. And we can see that they did indeed walk completely upright. Now, uh, in addition to Australopithecus afarensis, there is another Australopithecine from about 2 million years ago called Australopithecus sediba. And in this case, this is kind of a mix of both older and, and newer uh, hominid characteristics. The skull, the shoulders, and the arms look a bit like the older ones, um, but the hand and the pelvis look a little more modern, like it could carry out some more uh, intricate work with its hands and things. So what we're seeing at this time as, as Africa is drying out and um, 
uh, and the hominins have to move out of those um, forests that are disappearing and move into these grasslands that are appearing, we are slowly seeing these adaptive changes, right? Natural selection is selecting for characteristics that will be better for inhabiting those savannas. Now, genus Homo, that's what we belong to, right? We are Homo sapiens. And the oldest uh, uh, organism that belongs to this genus dates to about 2.8 million years ago. And uh, in this genus, the foramen magnum is moved forward to accommodate a completely erect posture. Now, the foramen magnum, usually I have a skull that I can hold here and show you guys. I don't, unfortunately, because I just don't happen to have a human skull sitting around my house. But basically, um, where your spine connects into your head, uh, that's the foramen magnum. And um, it has to be kind of, instead of being at the back of the head, it kind of moved this way slowly to accommodate uh, comfortably standing fully upright. Now teeth, uh, our premolars get a bit narrower. And tool making. Well, Homo is characterized by uh, the fact that these organisms made and used tools. However, some recent research shows that Australopithecus afarensis actually used tools um, as long ago as almost 3.4 million years ago. That was a paper I read just, I think, last year. And uh, so this, um, this shows that um, the ability to shape tools and figure out how to use them and what the best shape would be is not unique to genus Homo. Um, so that's uh, kind of some interesting uh, recent research. Now, as I said, selective pressures of the climate change moving to those uh, more arid grassland and savanna made bipedalism and this erect stature preferable because if you're not having a forest anymore to climb around in, well, those characteristics of needing to climb around in trees aren't necessary anymore, right? So anyway, let's take a look at some of these early uh, homo, genus Homo uh, uh, family members. Um, Homo erectus lived from about 1.9 million years ago to 70,000 years ago. And this was the first of the hominins to leave Africa. And its body was very similar to modern humans, but its skull is different, and the skull still retains some of the earlier characteristics. Uh, it has a smaller brain size, so modern humans, the brain is typically 1,400 to 1,600 cubic centimeters. Um, in Homo erectus, it was about 775 to 1,300 cubic centimeters. So um, even at its largest, it was still smaller than the typical modern um, um, human's brain. Uh, it has supraorbital ridges that are quite big. Now, when we talk about the orbits, that's where the eyes are. Supraorbital means above that. So there would be these big ridges above the eye sockets. The nose was going to be broad and flattened. And it is prognathous. And I'll show you in a moment what prognathous means. Okay, so this is a modern human skull. This is Homo erectus. Now there's that brow ridge that I'm talking about, those supraorbital ridges. And then that prognathus. Do you see how the chin kind of goes backwards? That's what prognathus means. So in a modern human, it kind of comes forward a little bit like that. Prognathus in Homo erectus. And so that's some of the little differences that you would see in the skull. Now, these guys were excellent hunters and tool makers, and they might have used fire. I put possibly there because in some locations where we have Homo erectus, uh, there is evidence that there was fire, but we can't tell whether it was like accidental, right? They came across a wildfire and, and had it, or uh, we, there's not that, you know, when, when people repeatedly use fire, you tend to get a hearth and you tend to get numerous fires on top of each other. We don't see that, but we do see some evidence that sometimes fire was present with these guys. So they might have known how to use fire. 
Okay, we'll, we'll come up to um, Neanderthals in volume two.